Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Male Management Recent Literature on How to Reduce Aggression in Male Mice, presented by one of our keynote presenters, Brianna Gaskell. She is an assistant professor of animal welfare in the College of Veterinary Medicine and part of the Center for Animal Welfare Science at Purdue University. I am Marjorie Torres of Labritz, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. Labroots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would, to like, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom or center of your screen. Or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the accreditation button located in the promotional board at the bottom or center of your screen and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Viana Gasco. I will now turn the presentation over to her. All right, thank you so much. And welcome to everyone who's attending this session on mouse aggression. Um, I'd just like to say that I was asked to give this presentation uh, due to a recent publication in the relaunch of Laboratory Animal and Lab Animal, um, where we, uh, myself and colleagues, looked at several different ways in order to modulate aggression in mice. And so I was very happy to talk about that, but I wanted to spend a little time uh, talking a little bit about social behavior in mice as well. So we'll talk about both of these throughout the, throughout the presentation. But before we get started, I want to introduce you to the MEAN team. So the work that I will be presenting later on in this presentation is uh, the result of lots of conversations and collaborations and ideas and uh, a lot of nerdy fun uh, between myself, Dr. Joseph Garner, who's at Stanford University, as well as Kathleen Pritchett-Corning at Harvard University. And so this is some of the results of some of the work that we've done together. So by far not something that I'm doing all in isolation here. So the first thing that we really need to talk about is social behavior in mice in particular or across various species of animals. So we can look at this in the idea that social behavior is not you're social, you're not social. It's really kind of a spectrum. And if we look at types of animals and the types of social behaviors that they act in, we can start off by looking at animals that really do not interact socially much at all. And so these are solitary groups of animals. And a really good example of this is the Bengal tiger that you can see in image here. Now, as we move more to groups that are slightly more um, social in terms of the spectrum, we have types of aggregations of animals. Now, this is where animals gather around a resource, but really there's not a lot of social interaction. And so an example of this would be fruit flies um, coming to a resource to eat food. And so they're gathering together, but really not interacting socially. Next, we have schools. Now, these types of groups of animals come together um, really for some type of mutual benefit. Now, for this particular example, something like predator avoidance is a really good example of why, of the type of benefit these animals might receive by uh, coming together in these large groups, but there's no relationships here. Moving on down the line, we have packs, prides, and troops of animals. Now these animals come together and interact for a very long period of time. Um, there's social relationships. Certain animals within the groups actually have certain roles or tasks to do within the group. Um, and actually survival can be very difficult without these group members. 
Now, the thing that's interesting about this type of animal and social behavior is that oftentimes reproduction and the ability to reproduce depends on the animal's social status. So those animals um, who may be higher up in the, in the wolf pack are more likely to uh, do the breeding. Now, the last type of social uh, interactions and relationships that animals might engage in are colonies or use social societies like bees. Now, these animals um, come together in very, very large related groups of animals. And in fact, there are some animals that don't ever reproduce at all, such as the worker bee. So when we look at these in terms of the types of behaviors that they're engaging in, in these different types of species across this social spectrum, we see that the bottom three, uh, or the three furthest to the left, really engage more in social interactions. This is where they're exchanging social stimuli and responses, um, such as mating, which is not really something uh, as social as social relationships, which is what we see in colonies as well as packs. Now these re relationships, individuals recognize each other and interact consistently over a significant amount of time and oftentimes can recognize specific individuals. Um, this could be some type of parental behavior uh, for those types of animals. Now, when we look at um, competition, we tend to see these animals that are not very social having to compete with one another for resources a lot more than we see in the animals that are engaging in relationships. However, those that do have these true social relationships um, seem to have a lot more co cooperation between one another, as well as overall support from those other members of the group. So we can see that in um, how these different animals interact differently in different social ways. And um, so this really leaves the question, where do mice actually fit into this spectrum? Well, hopefully we can look at this a little bit further and delve into um, some of the social behaviors of mice and figure out where they might fit. So the mouse social structure is really quite complex. So for the most part, mice live in loose, loose kin, kin groups called deems, where it's one male, one to two breeding females, and those are usually sisters, sub-adults, as well as pups within the nest. Now, one male owns a territory, uh, but the other adults, including females, will actually defend this territory quite viciously. And in fact, if you've never had the opportunity to read this book that's uh, featured in the upper right-hand corner, My Cell Over by Peter Crawcroft, it's a, fantastic, um, it's a fantastic read if you're interested in learning more about mice and how they interact in the wild. Now, Crawcraft actually talks about the most vicious, aggressive uh, behaviors he ever witnessed in this um, observations, uh, hundreds of observations, was actually from a female who was defending the, her young in her nest. But we also do see bachelor groups develop. At least this is what was described in Crawcraft's book. And we see these male groups kind of come together in this no man's land. As you can see in the, um, the image here, the box labeled B, these uh, squares are actually nest boxes. And if you notice, there's no dotted line around this particular box. That's because these animals are not defending any type of territory. So the others that you can see that are surrounded by the gray um, circles and dotted lines, those are clear dividing lines of an animal's, of a male's territory. So we definitely see that these bachelor groups do come together. However, Crowcraft often talked about them in terms of being decrepit and sickly looking. And so they probably were not of the highest fitness. Now, in terms of how Crowcroft was able to really depict those territories, um, and he often talked about if he could draw a line on the ground, he could very easily identify uh, exactly where those territories started and stopped. Well, this is probably because those mice had been uh, using territorial markings um, in order to kind of establish the boundaries of that territory. So mice use urinary cues uh, for nav navigation as well as edge detection, and they pr 
provide a lot of information uh, to, to others um, in the area. So it has an idea, they pass on information about identity, age, sex, dominance, and even health status. And as you can see in the image here, uh, these urinary cues actually even fluoresce in the UV, and you can actually see the visual distinction, such as this one uh, highlighted here on the left. This is actually the scent marking of a dominant mouse that has just been um, challenged. And so you can see he's really increased uh, the scent marking around the peripheral of his territory, which just happens to be a cage. And if you compare that to the mouse on the right, who is simply pooling his urine in the corners of the cage, is making no attempt to show that uh, peripheral marking of any type of territory. So even visually, these markings are quite distinct. And odor can be really important, not only in conveying uh, information, like I said about sex, age, uh, reproductive status, um, but it also helps, it also triggers some of these aggressive interactions. So these scent marks contain urinary pheromones um, and aggression promoting chemicals. Now these are used to determine essentially the maleness of rivals and those are deposited in those territor territorial peripheral marks that I just showed you. Now on the flip side, we find that other pheromones or odors seem to help reduce aggression. So the transferring of nesting material at cage change has been the only thing that's been found to truly re reduce aggression beyond just placing an animal in an in a odor-free environment, so such as a clean cage that's not doesn't have odor from other animals. So this is most likely due to the fact that nests are often kept clear of urine and feces, so they don't have these these aggression uh, components within them. Now, uh, we're not entirely sure what those pheromones are, but it's been theorized that these are uh, scents from the plantar glands um, that helps with individual recognition. However, this has not really been empirically tested as of yet. So. Animals engage in lots of different types of behaviors. And um, some of them can be positive and some of them can be negative. And so I wanna show you a couple different types of uh, negative interactions or aggression between mice. And the first of which is called mediated aggression. And essentially these are aggressive interactions that are actually what we would consider good aggression. And what I mean by that is that they're helping to stabilize the dominance hierarchy and that the animals are properly communicating and giving appropriate dominant and subordinate signals. And you should be able to identify this in the video. So if we could go ahead and play the video. So you can see from that video that after the submissive posture was given, uh, the aggressive interaction stopped altogether. Now compare that to escalated aggression, um, which is the next type of aggression. And this is often what we, t when, I t when you talk about aggression or fighting, this is probably more of what you're thinking about. Now escalated aggression is when those um, dominant and subordinate signals are not necessarily given appropriately, where an animal does not properly submit and actually retaliates. And you should be able to see this in this video as well. So if we could go ahead and play the escalated aggression video, please.
So in that video, you should have seen that the animal did not necessarily give the same submissive posture, at least in the beginning, um, as we saw in the mediated aggression video. And so these types of um, interactions lead to really the problem behavior of aggression, which tends to be wounding and biting and overall injury, which is something that we really don't want to have within the laboratory or with our experimental animals. Now, in terms of what the literature talks about on what seems to modulate aggression is that, um, and one of the things that's really important to point out is there's a lot of research on aggression, but most of the time, the type of aggression that people are using within an experimental setting is something that's artificial. So you might be using a resident intruder test, which is not necessarily something indicative of what animals within a typical shoebox cage would encounter. So in terms of looking at the research that simply looked at home cage behavior, where, we ha where we've been looking at spontaneous aggression and not necessarily provoked aggression in, that, in an experimental setting, um, there's really not as much to go by. However, this particular study by Van Lu et al. was lovely in looking at how group size and cage size may affect overall aggression. And this was very unique in the fact that most of the time when people were looking at uh, the amount of space per animal, they're altering the number of animals within the cage as well as the size of the cage itself. And so we're never really able to look at how does group size actually affect aggression. However, Van Lu did a really lovely job of controlling for these two factors and actually found that really cage space mice don't really care about as much. Overall, she did find that larger cages did seem to lead to more aggression, but she also found that in larger groups, those animals had less stable hierarchies. And so she looked at three different group sizes of, of mice, so groups of three, five, and eight, and she basically found groups of five or eight had significantly more wounding than groups of three. It's also been found that uh, groups that are familiar or related tend to result in less aggression overall. And this is essentially due to the fact that you're putting these animals together at a very young age and primarily before sexual maturity, and we tend to see less aggression overall. For territories, we also see that they, um, if you look at this image, you can see how each of these small little territories, each of these dotted lines seem to be encircling these squares or rectangles. Well, in Krautcroft's studies, he used and provided these nest boxes, and he found that mice almost always set up their territories around these nest boxes or physical structures. And the animals would utilize holes, choke points, and elevated platforms in order to ambush intruders that might come investigating into their territory. However, territory size and the degree of territoriality of the animals actually seems to depend on uh, environmental factors as well, um, such as resource allocation and distribution. Um, and that would affect home range size. Plus there are other social uh, interactions or aspects of social behavior that may alter this as well. So one of the things that we encounter in, um, in the lab is the provision of igloos or shelters, hard plastic physical shelters. And a lot of times we see that these are very popular, they're super easy to clean, um, and it actually looks enriched. So we're providing something to the animals that makes us feel good about what we're doing for them. However, there aren't a lot of studies that actually support uh, provision of this particular device into mouse cages. And not just because the animals actually like it, because of the negative interactions that we see after it's been provided. And why would that be exactly? Well, based on the image that I just showed you and the fact that mice are setting up these territories around physical structures, we're now introducing that physical structure into the cage for them to set this up around. And the fact that they find these shelters so highly valued and defensible that now you've essentially set off an aggression time bomb within your cage. And this was shown by Howerton et al, where they were looking specifically at home cage escalated aggression, so that rough and tumble injurious aggression that we're really worried about. And so what they did is they looked at 
um, the amount of regression that they found within the cage prior to any type of experimental treatment being applied and found that uh, they provided these igloos, similar to the one that I just showed you on this previous slide, the yellow one with the wheel on top, that regardless of whether the wheel was glued into place or it was freely moving, the implementation of this physical structure into the cage significantly increased the amount of escalated aggression, which in turn led to um, alterations in um, the dominance hierarchy. And so they found a negative correlation that as escalated aggression increased, they saw a reduction in the dominance hierarchy linearity. And so essentially there was a lot more chaos and the animals not necessarily knowing where they fell within this dominance hierarchy. We also find that with increased aggression and attacks that animals receive, this has a real implication of the scientific data that we're utilizing these animals for. So this study done by Barnett et al. in 1996 found another negative correlation that as animals receive more attacks, so they're um, being attacked by another animal within the cage, we saw that when they were injected with a blood-borne pathogen, they looked at the amount of antibodies that were produced by those animals and that if they received more attacks, they, they um, produced less of those antibodies for, those, uh, for that particular parasite. In addition, they looked at parasite clearance, so the number of urethrocytes that were still infected um, over the course of the experiment. And again, they found this um, interaction where when animals received more of those attacks, they had more of those infected urethrocytes still within their body. So these animals were having a difficult time or had an immune suppression in that they were not able to clear those particular pathogens. But environment, as I mentioned, can also have a huge impact on the overall amount of aggression. So in the wild uh, or in the lab, mice are actually pretty cold. So their lower critical temperature is right around 30 degrees Celsius, which is about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. However, we house them in this range that as you can see, has an increased overall metabolic rate. So mice are utilizing a lot of energy in order to just maintain a constant body core temperature. However, we find that animals held within this range um, have overall, uh, or at least in the lower parts of, this, of the guide recommended range, they have generally lower uh, aggression rates or aggression scores based on this one particular study. But as you increase the temperatures, even within the recommended range, you see in, uh, increases in overall aggression. So this is not something that uh, we want to utilize. And most likely, the cold uh, causes the animals to huddle together more likely, which seems to increase uh, social co compatibility and or cohesion. And so that's why it may have been way back when, when we first started uh, keeping mice in laboratories, somebody noticed that animals were less aggressive, they had less animals injured or died. This I'm not really sure, but it's possible that this was something that somebody just noticed and we've taken on. So let's get into the science that um, I want to present. And so I talked about the mean team working together and us thinking about some of these things. And whenever the three of us would go out and give a talk about mouse behavior, um, it was always one of the first questions we received. My mice are killing each other, what do I do? And so we started thinking about all of this information about what seems to modulate mouse aggression in the wild. And we started thinking about, okay, well, how could we maybe manipulate this? Well, we thought at least we could do it in one of two, in two ways, either at the end user, so those who are purchasing the animals for some type of scientific research, or perhaps the breeders could help with this as well. So those who are producing the animals that are going to be used for scientific research. So how could the animals be managed differently uh, before we, were sh we shipped them? Or how do particular genetics or environmental differences between breeders potentially influence um, alterations in overall aggression? And so at the time when we did this work, uh, Kate and myself were working at Charles River and had access to some animals um, for some of this research. 
So we first started asking questions, all right, well, what could end users do? What could these PIs or laboratory animal technicians or managers do to try to really mitigate aggression overall? Uh, well, the PIs could potentially utilize more females. However, this is a problem with a lot of the recent, especially here in the United States, NIH directives basically indicating that um, both sexes need to be used, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so that we can look at sex differences between the drugs or whatever we're testing on the animals. We could order younger animals, but a lot of times we get a lot of feedback that I don't have the space or money in order to just house the animals in my facility for X number, X amount of time before they actually start on the study. Uh, they could buy different mice. So there's definitely some genetic components associated with overall aggression in that some strains are definitely more aggressive than others. Uh, for instance, uh, FBBs are considered very aggressive mice, where even though most people complain a lot about black sixes, actually comparatively, they fall somewhere between the moderate to low end of overall aggression. Well, maybe we could actually house them a certain way. Maybe we could provide them with various types of enrichments in order to try to reduce some of this aggression. So that's really where we decided to go with this particular study. So a little basics of the design. We looked at just aggression in C57 black six in CRL mice. And we provided one of four um, enrichment provisions. So we had a control group where the animals only received the aspen bedding that everyone else received um, at the same amount. We provided them with a red physical hut uh, which is very commonly used, um, or provided them with sunflower seeds. Now, we heard a lot of anecdotal information that people were attempting to mitigate aggression by providing sunflower seeds at cage change or when they're initially housing the animals together. And that by providing the sunflower seeds in the bedding, the animals were foraging and um, distracted from potentially uh, um, fighting with one another. And then the last thing that we thought about was nesting material. Obviously, there'd been this previous study done by Van Lu that showed that overall transfer of nesting material and nesting material in general would reduce overall aggression. Now, one of the things we were worried about in this particular study is that oftentimes people transfer huts week to week and maybe don't necessarily wash them or put them through the cage wash on a weekly basis. And sunflower seeds not only would be the benefit of eating the seed, but also the foraging associated with it. And potentially nesting material would be transferred as well. And so we were worried about um, these enrichments not necessarily being exactly the same. So one of the things that Van Lu did not necessarily look at was the presence of nesting material itself without necessarily that transfer, does that seem to reduce aggression by itself. So what we did in order to try to uh, control for all of these slightly different things, every week um, animals got a completely clean new cage and bedding. Um, we didn't just dump them. Animals got an entire bottom and top um, that were fresh and had never been used by animals before. Um, the animals received a fresh hut every week. Um, and that when we provided the 50 grams of sunflower seeds, they were sprinkled within the feeder so that the animals didn't necessarily get that added enrichment of overall foraging. And then lastly, mice were provided with fresh uh, eight grams of nesting material, crinkle paper nesting material every week. So we did these in conjunction with another particular um, experimental variable, which was scent. Um, we had been hearing a lot of people thinking that they could potentially reduce overall aggression by providing some, uh, some odors such as lavender, which at least in, in humans and in some other animals has shown to have a calming effect. So we used um, a, a lavender essential oil and wiped it with a, a, a Q-tip on the, the edge of the cage. And then as our controls, we wiped water on the, on the side of the cage. The animals arrived at approximately seven to eight weeks of age. And we had five animals per cage that were randomly allocated from their shipping boxes into that uh, particular enrichment and scent combination. 
Now, how did we measure aggression? Well, actually, we decided that we um, wanted to measure the overall result. So we weren't as interested in all of these small little behavioral interactions, but what was the end result? So we're more worried about the wounding that all of this aggression and most likely escalated aggression resulted in. So what we did is we developed this pelt aggression lesion scale, which we fondly called PALS. Um, and it was based on a scoring system of zero to four, looking at wounds or discoloration all the way up to full thickness wounds and potentially um, entirely absent integument in some of these extremely aggressive animals. And what we did was after euthanasia, um, the animals were pelted and we put, we laid virtually this three by three grid on top of the subcutis of the pelt. And this was based off of the human rule of nines, which essentially allocates equal amounts of surface area to various areas of the body. And so what we would do is we scored from zero to four, each of these nine regions, and also uh, added in and weighted based on the percentage of that particular grid region that could actually be read. So for instance, for the top right grid, um, that's the right shoulder, you see that some of it is actually blocked off with fur. And so that particular region would probably only get a weight of 75% of that grid being accurately read. And this particular um, uh, measure was validated and actually found to be very sensitive in that it can distinguish between actual aggressive wounding and wounding associated from ulcerative dermatitis. And so we were really excited to see that this could distinguish the difference between those two. So in terms of our overall results from this particular study, nicely we found that with increasing PAL scores, we saw increasing severity. So that was really um, good to see that our, our measure was actually measuring what we thought. And then we found that overall, surprisingly, enrichments in general did not alter PAL scores. However, we did find that controls and sunflower seeds had slightly higher scores, but that was not significantly different from huts or nesting material which was a little surprising to us because based on the literature that I just showed you about implementing physical structures, this should have increased escalated aggression, but apparently it wasn't enough to increase uh, PAL scores altogether. However, we did see some differences in increasing average body weight with increasing PALS. Now, this definitely could be the fact that as animals are spending more time in the cage, they're getting heavier and there's more time for them to receive some of these injuries. So this is something that we're wanting to look into a little bit further. But the result that I think we were all a little surprised with was actually the scent being the only thing in this particular study that we found um, real significant differences based on our main treatments. And basically we found that lavender increased uh, the weighted PALS score. So these animals had more injury than the animals did that just received the water. So this was quite surprising to us, seeing as how um, lavender is supposed to be calming and we were hoping it might reduce aggression or do nothing at all. But oddly enough, we found that lavender increased overall PAL scores. So whatever you do, do not try to provide any type of aromatherapy, specifically lavender aromatherapy to your animals without proper examination. So, Next, we moved on, and at about the time we were running this particular study at Charles River, our colleague Joe was running a study over, in, um, over at Stanford, and he was looking at some of those idiosyncratic be, um, aggressive behaviors that I showed you, and so he sent us this video, and we were all shocked simply due to the interactions that I showed you earlier are about different communication cues that the animals have to identify dominance and subordinates. So in this particular video, one of the things that I want you to notice is that one particular animal is definitely showing a lot of dominance-related behavior or aggressive-related behaviors, and the other animals in the cage appear to be providing the appropriate social cues to stop that particular aggressive interaction. However, the dominant doesn't seem to react the same way. 
And then essentially it becomes extremely chaotic and we start to see behaviors that we would not necessarily expect. So if we could go ahead and play the aggression video, please. So you probably saw in that video, the animals doing lots of submissive, submissive postures, but those negative interactions really not stopping. Now the thing that was just shocking to us, so those are really appropriate cues the animals should have been giving. Granted, the dominant was not responding appropriately, was when those animals that were giving those upright, subordinate, um, submissive postures, a few minutes after, they went back into their corners and started tail rattling. Tail rattling is a territorial behavior, and subordinates don't tail rattle, or at least it's very unlikely. It's not the appropriate settings for them to potentially be doing those tail rattling. And as you notice, they tail rattled in the corners, and then the dominant came back over, and then they submitted again. They gave those submissive postures. And so it really appeared that these animals were not speaking the same language. They were not communicating the way that they're supposed to. And so we really started thinking about this and how in other animals, dogs in particular, that if you take them away um, from their litter mates and their mother too early in age, they don't really ever learn how to respond appropriately um, like a dog. And so we started wondering if there was a sensitive period in mice and that Actually, maybe we're taking them away from uh, taking them, weaning them too early, where they're not necessarily learning these appropriate dominant and subordinate cues. So we went back to the literature, and we found that um, Curly et al. in 2009 looked at weaning animals at two different ages, at 21 days or in at 28 days, and found that essentially the animals that were weaned later seem to have longer durations of social interactions, which we thought was really interesting. And so whether that actually indicates social competence, that's a different question, but at least they're engaging, they seem to engage more in social interactions. So we kept thinking about weaning and how it's really a gradual process and that about 10 to 17 days of age, mice start eating solid foods. Um, we definitely see a reduction in nursing behavior around 21 days, which is probably why we wean them, as well as the point where there's a new litter probably coming into the cage. Um, but we also see that, at least in the wild, uh, mice tend to remain in the natal nest up until sexual maturity. So there's lots of opportunities for them to engage in these uh, different types of behaviors. And then uh, we noticed that in this same paper by Curly et al, that they were talking about this pup mounting behavior. And it was seen around the time of weaning. And they described it specifically for females because this was uh, at least a cage of pups and a female. And um, there were no males in the cage, so they thought perhaps it was just a way to keep the pups from nursing. But at about the same time, I was reviewing, I was working on another project where I was viewing a lot of reproductive um, behavior 
and watching a lot of breeding cage behavior. And I started seeing these same behaviors. However, I saw the male doing them as well. So in this particular video, you'll actually see the female kind of passed out in the left-hand corner of the cage. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the male attempting to mount a few pups. So if we'll go ahead and play that video. So you saw that male grooming as well as mounting that pup at the same time. And we actually see mounting behaviors in females as some type of dominance as well. And so in Curley's paper, they actually found that around the days when those animals were going to be weaned, and they also weaned these groups of animals at different ages in a previous generation, that they saw an increase of those mounting behaviors right around the points when those animals had previously been um, weaned. So if you were weaned uh, at 21 days, you had your own litter. You started doing more of that pup mounting at 21 days, but if you were weaned at 28 days and then had your own litter, you tended to show an increase of those mounting behaviors a little bit later, so at about 24 days, and another slight increase right around 28. And so we started really thinking about it, well, maybe there's something here. Maybe these animals are being taken away too early, and that just at the point where we're separating them, that's the point where they're starting to learn these dominant and subordinate cues. So we looked a little bit further into the literature, and in one particular study by Kiksui et al., um, they found that animals that were weaned at different days of age, so 14 days or 21 days, that they had significant differences in the number of wounds that those animals received. So animals at 14 days had significantly more wounds than those that were weaned at 21 days. Now, I will put out this particular caveat that this was a um, separation-induced uh, aggression paradigm where the animals were separated for, I believe, four, four weeks and then brought back together for a week. And so they looked at the number of wounds those animals received. So not exactly the situation that we're thinking about, about just in-home cage behavior. But we also see that weaning age seems to lead to abnormal behavior development as well. So Verbal and Staffordshire in 1997 found that pups that were weaned at 17 days of age had, had pretty high levels of wire gnawing stereotypies, a, a particular type of abnormal behavior. However, even animals that were weaned at more of a typical age, so about 20 days, um, if they were in the lower part of the average uh, weaning weight, they had fairly similar amounts of uh, wire gnawing stereotypies. But if you were in the upper average of that particular litter, you had significantly lower. So it might be something to do with maybe these animals are not fully, um, are not uh, fully developed in the way that they should be. So we took this knowledge and we decided to take it back to, um, uh, to the breeder and what we could change. Well, we could potentially alter the way animals are shipped. However, we didn't have the opportunity to examine that. We could potentially look at the age at which the animals are weaned, which based on some of this previous literature seems to indicate um, and alter their overall behavior. Or maybe what we could do is we could look at how the animals were handled. So at the time at Charles River within their breeding facility, the animals were weighed and resorted on a weekly basis. And so these animals were sorted and resorted until they were potentially sold. And this could be multiple times. But maybe instead of doing that, what if we held the animals in stable groups, if that would affect the overall aggression? So what we did is we applied two different treatments, again, to our same C57 black six mice. Um, and the first treatment was weaning age. We weaned animals at 14, 21, or 28 days of age. And this was applied in a factorial design with two different mixing treatments. The first was the standard quo of weekly mixing based on weight. And the second was due to stable weaning groups. 
So once they were weaned, even though there might be a few litters within this big um, stock cage, they were not constantly mixed and remixed. They stayed with those group of animals. Again, at about seven to eight weeks, we had the animals shipped to us, and we again allocated five animals per cage in, uh, in a vive disposable caging. And what we found was that we did find a significant difference in our overall PAL score based on weaning age. However, it was the complete opposite of what we expected in that we expected that the 14 day old, 14 day of age weaned pups would be more aggressive or would have more wounding. But in fact, we found they had the least and that the animals that had the later weaning, the 28 day old, they seem to have the overall higher PAL scores or overall wounding. Now we didn't find any significant differences due to mixing or stable groups in this particular study. So with some of this data, we went back and we were thinking about, well, maybe not all black six are created the same. We'd again heard a lot of different anecdotal evidence that uh, PI swore that they would only buy a particular type of uh, black six mouse from one particular vendor. So we decided to actually evaluate that under the same conditions. So what we did is we bought um, animals, black six, C57 black six mice of different substrains. So animals from Jax, uh, Charles River mice, Harlan, which is now in Vigo, as well as Taconic. And we compared these animals in their overall wounding and wounding rate at about the same time. And ultimately found that we didn't have any significant differences in overall PAL scores between these substrains. So at least in the conditions that we were housing them in, it didn't seem to alter their overall uh, wounding rate. However, with this particular study, um, we had just received a uh, tail tattoo machine and we were really eager to try it out. And so we had run these other previous two studies uh, with animals simply being ear snipped or ear marked, ear notched. And so before, instead of completely switching our method of, um, of marking animals, we decided to at least of all of these substrains, five, animal, five cages received the traditional ear notch and five of the cages received um, the uh, tail tattoo. And of course, again, this is not what we expected whatsoever. And we found that um, overall, the marking method in this particular experiment was more influential on overall wounding than um, the substrain, and that animals with the ear slice had significantly higher weighted PAL scores than those that received the tail tattoo, which again was something that was completely surprising to us um, and not something that we expected at all. So with all of this data, I'm sure you're probably sitting there thinking, all right, well, you found things that were completely opposite. I still have to figure out what to do with my mice. So if you have animals that may be hanging out in your lab for an extended period of time, maybe housing those males with over overeactomized females may be a solution. There have been a few publications showing that um, overeactomized females, specifically most likely of the same strain, are going to be actually really good partners for those animals, providing the social interaction without necessarily the negative ramifications of social interaction. And in fact, the study uh, by Spani et al. at the bottom here showed that those animals that were housed with that overreactomized female had overall lower heart rates than the individuals that were housed by themselves. So this might be an option. And that even in uh, the study done by a at Waldison, she found that you could pair and repair those overeactomized females, even with very young males, and they were still very successful. So this might be a good solution. So overall, uh, some conclusions that I will leave you with is that overall social interaction is essential for social species. And definitely, I think we've shown that mice fall somewhere within the middle of that spectrum of social interactions and potentially social relationships, seeing as how they may have multiple generations overlap within one particular deem. And so combating aggression is still a really major challenge, and we're still working to try to figure out how to reduce overall rates of aggression in um, our vivariums. But some of the work that Van Lu did had some really good in, um, tips on how to actually um, reduce this. And so 
the first of which was to try and house males in small stable groups at a young age, to transfer nesting material during cage cleaning, to keep disturbances at a minimum. And actually she recommended trying to combine procedures such as cage cleaning with some type of manipulation, perhaps an injection. And actually I found this to be very successful with CD1s in a toxicology project that I've worked on. Uh, making sure that when you provide enrichments, you provide the right amount so that they can't be um, uh, guarded and that uh, nesting material is probably better than rigid huts that can easily be uh, protected and territory set up around. And last, definitely be conscious of the marking method you're using because you may be modulating overall aggression simply by identifying the type, the mouse from one and another. And with that, I'd like to thank my aggression collaborators, my mean team here, and uh, point you to um, an overall pretty quick and dirty review that I wrote for the enrichment record um, in the winter of 2014 that might provide you with some good resources as well as a general overview of aggression. And I believe that's still readily available via the web. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that um, we might have. Thank you, Dr. Brianna Gaskell, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your questions into the box that appears on your screen and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, what is better for my male mouse's welfare, individual housing or social housing? So this is something that a lot of us are debating. Um, so you're potentially weighing one welfare issue for another. So individual housing, the literature shows ubiquitously that isolation can be can have some very negative implications for mouse welfare, um, alteration of physiology, um, lower brain derived neurotropic factors, increased cortis, uh, corticosterone, so stress hormones. And this is something that actually was recently um, debated quite, quite nicely in a study or a review by Kappel et al. in 2017 in the journal Animals. And actually, they were debating whether the welfare is beneficial in one versus the other. And essentially, one of the results that they came out with is that for some of these very aggressive strains, so such as FEBs, which we know are extremely aggressive, that overall, it might be overall more beneficial to house those males by themselves. Potentially um, providing some type of overreactimized female might be an option, but um, just the risk of the injury and wounding and pain and potential suffering that those animals are very likely to encounter, we they believed that that offset the welfare implications, uh, negative welfare implications from isolation housing. So overall, it probably depends on your facility, what kind of prevalence of overall aggression you have. But definitely, I would encourage you to attempt to utilize some of these tips that I showed on the conclusion slide um, to try to figure out how you might be able to mitigate, mitigate aggression. But of course, um, every single facility is slightly different and you have to make the best decision possible. Thank you for that answer. Our next question is, what should I do if one of my PIs insists on signingly housing their male mice, but their justification is not very credible? Obviously, this is probably more of something that would be addressed by the IACUC at that particular institution. And it's up to the IACUC to, de to determine whether their justification is credible or not. However, it doesn't mean that you don't have an opportunity to educate that particular PI. You can definitely uh, present them with literature that shows that um, isolation housing of their animals could potentially alter the data that they're hoping to get from them. So for instance, um, a lot of the current literature is showing that isolation increases anxiety and depression behaviors um, and typical tests such as the open field, the plus maze, or even sucrose consumption. 
And that, again, you're seeing increases in overall stress. And stress can have so many effects on the body. And so making sure that your PI is, is aware of what these two different housing types may imply in terms of their data quality. And so it could be that maybe they do have a really aggressive strain, so it may be the better option to singly house those animals because the likelihood of having to separate them is going to be significantly higher. So again, um, this is probably a question best left up to the iCook and making sure that they're doing their job to make sure that there is a strong scientific reason for singly housing these animals, but it doesn't mean that you can't provide some peer-reviewed literature for that PI to uh, come to a decision based on all of the information possible. Okay, we have time for one more question. Our last question is, can I transfer dirty bedding? Do not do that. So um, I have heard instances where people have had success with this, but I would caution you quite strongly about not doing this. Um, the reason being that, so I showed you those images of the scent marks being distributed around the perimeter of, of the cage, most likely, because that's what the dominant sees as its territory. And then you saw the subordinates that were pooling their urine in the corners of those cages. Now, how do you know that you are absolutely picking up the uh, scent marks of that dominant mouse and putting it in the cage, um, into the clean cage or strewing it around? Basically, probably what's happening is if you do sprinkle that dirty bedding around in the cage, it's entirely likely that you're transferring some of those subordinate scents as well. And they get into this new cage and the dominant's like, hey man, I thought we got this all figured out. And he's like, I swear I didn't do it. But it's possible that you're transferring the wrong smells. And so that's why we generally recommend do not transfer any type of dirty bedding. And then if you're gonna transfer anything at all, transfer the nesting material as long as it's clean and fluffy. So with highly aggressive cages, we definitely see um, nest building falter and actually the nesting material just ends up being scattered throughout the throughout the, the cage. And so it's very difficult to find any clean nesting material. I would tell you not to transfer that dirty, greasy um, nesting material that doesn't come from a concentrated nest site that's clean and fluffy because you again may be transferring some of those um, uh, urinary pheromones or aggression, aggression, aggressive stimulating chemicals in the urine from the bedding and or dirty nesting material. So just make sure that the nesting material is clean and fluffy and that you don't see any types of urine or feces present within the nest and that that's what you should transfer. I would like to once again thank Dr. Brianna Gaskell for her for her presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May of 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>